Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Hi, you're welcome, uh, welcome, listeners, to Pods with Nick and James. Um, conversations between two blokes, uh, the sorts of conversations you'd possibly have down a pub. Um, I don't know, the kind of conversations you, you can't have around a water cooler, as there's just too much gossip. Um, but anyway, uh, we're joined today by, obviously, myself. And uh, uh, yeah, host and producer of this show, Nick. Hi guys. There Hello, you Nick. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, today's topic, uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of a look at the history of money and a little kind of brief skimp into economics. The more I look into economics, the more I see that this is yeah like an iceberg type of subject so i'm afraid we will mostly be dealing with uh the stuff that's above water like what is money where did it come from how did it evolve uh what are some of the basic and i'm talking basic uh banking practices uh in this country in the us and in the capitalist world as a whole um got a couple of interesting facts uh i will freely admit um i am taking most of this information uh from a couple of google searches but then also from history of money uh, a financial history from barter to bitcoin by uh, Mark, mike thornton um what i loved about his book uh is unlike the history of money by jack weatherford or uh, economics, a very short introduction. Um, the book doesn't immediately start with uh, a gonzo journalism style story of one person in Africa and one person in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, just to you other guys who wrote economic books, I'm sure your works are brilliant, but and I'm sure the stories that you're telling may very well be true. But the fact that out of three books that I looked at, two of you did it, Brian, come up. Nope, nope, gonna hold my. <laughs> um, there's a lot of interesting facts to do with money. You don't need to. Maybe, maybe your regular audience isn't aware of how bad some sometimes it is in some places in Africa, yeah, and how you don't need to go it straight is. for the sucker punch, do you? But it, it, exactly. Like that. Look. Okay. This is the thing. I don't have a problem with people telling the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a uh, an amazing uh, small theatre performance. Didn't know it was about gay conversion therapy, but it was. And although, like, it's very easy to get offended when someone's saying something against your religion, the fact that it was honestly done, intelligently written, and contained obvious real life emotions from real life experiences that these actors had had meant I had nothing but praise for them by the end of it. I was deeply troubled, but also deeply moved. And it was just, wow. Whereas this stuff... I, okay, so me and you have both been raised in a very affluent society. However, we've also been raised in a society which is constantly bombarded by images of poor Africa. And although yeah. there is some truth in that, 
there's also lots of parts of Africa where it's actually doing quite well for themselves. There's lots of parts of Africa where people are just going about their business, living lives as people. Yes, there's a lot of on, and I'm not saying we need to cancel financial aid. By all means, send more financial aid. But don't just bombard... Like it, The thing that weirded me out is it was like... The book seemed too much like television. Like, I, I was going in hoping for some historical facts and stuff, and immediately it's just this. And it, it's also interesting when you look up on TikTok and stuff, the number of affluent African people who are genuinely offended by the way that the West portrays Africa, generally. Mm. You know, yeah. as, this, as this chaotic, heedless mass of need. That's not what it is. All right, bringing it back, bringing it back in. Okay, so yeah, um, economics is a very short introduction, and both the history of money both start with a Gonzo-style journalism ex uh, explanation of uh, how one person in Africa and one person in the U.S. lives, and I found it too indicative of the way that the media portrays Africa and uh, economic inequality generally. Uh, yeah, I mean, you didn't need to look at two different... I mean, I think that's just a thought provoker there, isn't it? It's just, it's, this it's is Africa, and everybody's got that mentality of Afri Africa being really poor, and so that's e an easy thing for people to follow, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. you could have just gone, here's a person from from the roughneck part of Boston who has no money and has to fight for his own... Um, pennies and then you've got somebody who lives on the uh, who, who works on, on the new new york stock exchange making millions like transferring million pounds worth of stock every day you know so there's contrast but these gone they've both gone from ex for extremes which are stereotypical at best and not actually necessarily reflective of actual um events yeah. in the well, area. It's, it's hard to know how things are but uh mm. um anyway right Okay, um, so the so my main shout out goes to uh, Mike Thornton, who wrote the history of money uh, about finances. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, at that to begin with. Um, yeah. Okay. So if we so do you know what the the first form of trade was, Nick? Like, what, how what do you reckon it started with? I should imagine it started with barter, didn't it? Absolutely. Uh, so essentially, I have this. You, I want. Like, I have a pig that I've hunted today, but you're a builder. Can you build me? Can Can you build me a house, and I'll give you this pig? Absolutely. That's exactly how it started. Like the the good thing about it is, is that the barter system meant that you didn't need an intermediary, but because you didn't have an immediate intermediary the way that it would often end up working out is you had needed to have intermediary interactions in order to get the thing that you wanted so you know if you for example had a pig and you needed new shoes um but the person who was selling the shoes didn't want a pig you needed to find out what they wanted and then you would need to go trade your pig for that or trade your pig for something else, then for then something else, that. then yeah. for something else. And yeah, each yeah. time, those who are kind would not rip you off, but those that were not, would. <laughs> you'd end up with nothing. You'd end up with like half a shoe by the end of it. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, society was so much simpler back then as well, because like everybody needed food. And everybody, and, and as the hunter or the provider, um, you didn't have time to, like, build yourself a house or, or, or make yourself some clothes or, like, sharpen your weaponry, etc. You were hunting most of the day, every day. So, you tend to just, you feed into your own economy just by doing your job. And then you come back and you go, right, can you, like, I will supply food for your family if you then provide your services to me and my family by building me a house or or providing some clothing and like we'll we'll make an, an agreement on that that we'll have like that 
that kind of scenario going on where I will hunt the food and you guys will keep my house maintained and food and, and clothing maintained etc well that's exactly it like it was a bit, it was a more simple system and at this time you also started to have debt as some families would need to borrow food off of their neighbors so that they didn't starve and as debt, debt is a subjective co concept, I also imagine this is where the original need for maths in day-to-day -day life was derived from. You know, like, how much, how many cattle did we owe uh, the, I don't know, the Jacobsons down the road? How much did we owe to them? Or yeah. how much did we give this other family? Um, I think maybe like when it during this to... time. Uh, maybe when it we when we started agriculture and uh and um animal husbandry and stuff like that maybe but aside from that it was just hunt kill bring back hunt kill bring back yeah no well, during this time settlement started to grow as cooperation led to prosperity um, unfortunately, this led to more complicated debts as rulers would demand more formal tribute in the form of the original taxes. Um, I know a lot of people out there consider tax simply to be a form of extortion or theft. Um, I, yeah, I've, I've actually written this. What are your thoughts about tax generally? <laughs> okay, so I do, I side, I'm a little bit I've got splinters on my bum, I suppose. Um, I'm on the fence. I understand the need for um, like the government to have a kitty to feed from in order to run the country, mm. and our taxes, by being citizenry, should feed into that. Um, so you're basically paying for the government to do the things that you're not able to outreach and do yourself. Um, hospital facilities, etc., etc. However... I can't help but think that their choice of spending has led to the level of tax being increased so high that the 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 cost of living is um, almost unaffordable for the normal layman. Absolutely, which then, by raising the the cost of living, then feeds more into people having a larger need, therefore needing more taxes in order to feed their need. Um, which yeah. is just, yeah, it's it's definitely a thing. Like, I, I will agree with you, I understand the need for order. Um, and I do like the fact that we don't... I don't know, people, people in this country don't tend to starve to death. And that is something, at least, that I'm moderately proud of. Out of all of the bad things about, like, Britain as a whole, like, the fact that we don't have out of all the evils we don't have that evil at least no, we something. don't um, there's something that i was made aware of when um when the kids started going to school and that was that like there are three out of ten children that go to school without breakfast in the morning now i know that sounds like quite a first world problem but this is the uk and these yeah, kids are mi missing meals because their parents can't afford to buy them breakfast or have to go and leave for work too early and therefore don't get that part of their routine. Um, so, like, money itself is causing such a cycle of parentless children with, like, parentless hungry children. Um, like, the state of society is going to suffer, surely, because of that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it. Uh, you know what, we'll go into, uh, I should have got some more stuff to do with in inequality here, but that's a that's a very fair point, is 3 in 10, did you say? Yeah. So literally 30%, nearly a third. Yeah. Okay. And that's one of the reasons uh, why I Rashford don't... was fighting so much for free school meals, um, because, like, some kids that school meal most days of the week might be their only hot meal, you know? And that's because of the state of no, the cost of all. living. That's because of how high taxes are. It's because of how high utility bills are, you know? Mm. Oh, dear. Okay, well, that's... That's not good. Um, all right, well, you know what? 
maybe we'll maybe we'll do one of these literally about poverty and about its different forms and different places uh, that's mm. that's something to consider for the time yeah all right uh formal tax on a large scale oh, i'm gonna go back to what what notes i've got but formal tax on a large scale required more organized and standardized form of tribute which led to uh which uh forms to Oh, okay. I misspelled that there. All right, but it basically med, uh, led to things uh, like uh, capital. So, like uh, capital, the word for that is actually taken from cattle, as cattle were used in a were used as a form of tax. So, so, like if you had a certain herd of a certain size, you were required to give a certain amount of that uh, that property over to over to the government. Um, sacks of grain uh, were often traded uh, feathers and shells and certain types of to uh, stone were also traded um, the first steps towards money as we know it today came from uh, trading base metals uh, this also required the standardized units of weight to be agreed to have an agreed upon value um, the one that I always remember from like the stories in the Old Testament, was uh, where you have the term shekel used a lot, uh, which was a weight of, always a weight of metal. What annoyed me is when I did a bit more research to actually find out how much a shekel was. Uh, it turns out it varied massively over where you were and what time scale you were in. Um, there were some highs and lows, and it literally varied between 7 and 17 grams. So it lit there were times when it was literally double what it was at other points. Um, wow. Yeah, I, d I don't know, but talk about unreliable, right? Uh, you know, if I yeah. pay for a coffee and I get half a coffee, I'm annoyed, you know? Yep, um, yep. if I go to, the generally... go to the pub and I ask for a pint of beer and half of my pint is head... And the rest of it is beer. I'm going to give it back to them and tell them to fill it up. Absolutely, absolutely. Here's another one for for you guys. If you buy the cheapest thing at McDonald's, if they get your order wrong, it's a free upgrade. All right. Um, but moving moving on. Um, <laughs> it's one of those. We're no, not sponsored by McDonald's, I, I, but if I you use I, this code. I <laughs> no, 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 no. But exact. But I'm um, sadly, I do this when I'm when I'm like don't necessarily have time to cook myself a proper meal or don't want to go out and like you know do the shopping and stuff if you go to the drive through pick yourself up a wrap of the day for two quid and they get your order wrong it it's literally it's the cheapest thing in the menu you know you can't it yeah there's no point in uh, they, they can't even give out the food that they've got wrong once once they've given it to you, you and you physically give it back they can't give it to anyone um but anyway sorry that nurse going nowhere there but and it kind of sadly talks of the type of man i am but uh <laughs> yeah anyway uh back to back to this um the records of base metals uh being used goes back to a thousand years bc um however there there are known um imitations of uh, the imitate, sorry, the first coins. I'll tell you what, here's a weird one. What do you consider to be a coin? I mean, a coin it's not, is... It's not a, a trick question, mate. I'm not... I'm it's not a, small disc of, a small disc of valuable metal, isn't it? Dependent on your time, it yeah, might be yeah. copper or, or brass. It might be iron, but then eventually it would end up... Uh, silver and gold wouldn't it yeah absolutely okay well it's i i'm a i've got a little bit annoyed here because all of the websites and the books that i've like listened to um like give the give the invention of coins um to the city state of lydia uh which is in modern day turkey all right. However, and although the Lydia coins were do look a lot more like what you'd expect a coin to be, 
mm. the Chinese were were handing out or were using small bits of metal shaped like a shaped like a crown shell for like hundreds of years before that now although the crown shell isn't round it's still a small metal to token which has clearly been made into a certain shape to represent a certain value and because it just seems really similar to me of handing over a small object in order to get something that that in itself to me seems like money um but yeah like the it's it i will admit the chinese ones are made of iron and the lydia coins um were made of uh electrum oh, i'll tell you what points if you know what electrum is that is i, learned, I did beforehand. isn't that silver and gold yeah absolutely yeah that's exactly what it is nicely done See? All right. Minecraft so, comes in clutch. Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, no. But this, but this is it. I, I only knew what... I didn't know what Electrum was made out of, but I now understand why in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, it's it's kind of annoying to me that they've, they've obviously squeezed it in there, wanting people to learn a little bit of culture, to learn a little bit of history. Mm. Um... But all it ends up being is this kind of pointless currency that no one uses because it's literally halfway between a silver piece and halfway between a gold piece. Now, the weird thing about the Electrum pieces is that they were worth their weight in gold, yet they're not pure gold, they're Electrum. So in a way, this was the first instance, in my mind, of uh, quantitative easing or exaggerated yep. value. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting that kings would put their faces on these things as a way of being trustworthy, yet by watering down the metal, by mixing the metal with base metals, you're not only... Well, you're not only lying, but you're putting your face on a lie. Like, maybe it was a, like an entirely a power thing, but like literally by putting your face on a lie and getting everybody else to tell you that it's true... Maybe that was just a massive way of, you know, like uh, just a massive ego trip or getting off on your own power. But I suppose it's, me... it's the first instance of. Sorry, go on. No, no. Well, it it just it seems really weird. It in ancient society, your honor um, was high. Was was your worth was linked to your honor, and your honor was linked to your virtue. If you if your word was me means nothing, it means you couldn't get by because you couldn't trade with people because people would not trust you. You know? Um, yeah. It's interesting that you had these kings... You had these kings lie, be honest uh, in a way about their lie, advertise their lie, put their face on this lie, and not only stay at the top but be but it be recorded i i when i like i've told a lot of lies in my life and i've made a lot of mistakes in my life i don't want any of those ones on my tombstone i don't want any of those ones being the yeah. thing that i am remembered for you know yeah mm -hmm. and yet yeah a lot of a lot of people seem to get off or get off on this um all right so uh Sorry, what you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say it sounds more like it. Well, it sounds like it's uh, the first instance of um, somebody making out they've got more, or making more more um, wealth out of less, if you know mm. what I mean. So they've got a pot of gold, so they mix it down with a bit of silver, and then they buy the gold's value. Like the the combined weight of of uh, silver and gold, mm. um, the the gold's value of that weight um, in items, and therefore make themselves wealthier. <clears throat> um, you'll That's you'll exactly probably it, come like... to this point. You'll probably come to this point a bit later on, but obviously, um, 
the banking system itself is built on that very premise that they've got x amount and it is an x that they're they're, they're saying and then what they do is they then create two x's and um duplicate their value well, i'll explain yeah. more more in detail later when we talk about the monetary system but um, yeah that's, that's that's fair enough the, the fair whole enough. the whole cycle of debt and creating more from nothing um mm. You know, if it was equal, if it was equal to the weight of both silver and gold, then it would be equal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not. It's the it's equal to the weight of gold, and gold is more valuable. Therefore, you know, it's like it's like drug dealers when they get an ounce of cocaine and they they chop it up and they mix it with half an ounce of baby powder or baby teething powder. You know, and then yeah. all of a sudden they sell an ounce and a half's worth of cocaine. They haven't got an ounce yeah. and a half's worth of cocaine. They've got an half, ounce and a half worth of powder, of which there is an ounce of cocaine within. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to spoil one of the interesting facts I learnt for our listeners right now. Um, but most US dollars in circulation have trace amounts of cocaine in them. <laughs> that does not surprise me. I watched yeah. this video the other day on... Um... I think it was a, it was a short on YouTube, and this kid was so proud of himself because he found a dollar rolled up in the in the in the um found a dollar rolled up in the uh, supermarket, and his his sister is like videoing him going, "Are you sure you want to be touching that?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure." And like, she's like, "How did you find it?" And he was like, "It was rolled up in the rolled up in the aisle," and and she was like, "What do you think? Why do you think it was rolled up?" And he went. It was like that dawning realization fell across his face, and he just dropped this dollar on the floor and freaked out. It was hilarious. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, that's mean, but like I get, I get that is video worthy. Sadly. Oh, okay. Well, Lydia is in modern day Turkey, uh, north northwest of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, yeah. So the first coins were Electrum. Uh, which is a mix. Actually, you're absolutely right. It's a mixture of silver and gold. Uh, the surviving examples um, have aged amazingly well, which makes sense as gold is imperishable. But I know silver tarnishes somewhat. Silver tarnishes, however, it's in, it doesn't it doesn't break road. down in the same way that like iron does. Yeah. Okay, so the, the tarnishing isn't oxidization. No. Okay. It's right. more like a dirt kind of thing over the top. Absolutely. Well, well, that's why when silver goes old, it goes black. If you guys, if uh, any of our listeners find themselves at an antiques fair, I don't know who listens, but if you do, if somebody's trying to sell you something as pure silver, and yet it's gone coppery, as in, as it, if it has tarnished. gone green, if it's tarnished green rather than black, it ain't silver, and mm. they're having you on. Um... Anyway, sorry, that's something I learnt from porn stars. Uh, right, where was I? Okay, um, what I know I've already shared this story, I think, in this podcast, so I'm very sorry to our listeners for repeating ourselves, but the word money uh, comes from uh, Juno Monita, uh, which means uh, Juno the Warner or Juno the Advisor, as... Uh, Juno, who is uh, the Roman version of the Greek god Hera, so it's like Jupiter or Zeus, uh, the, the, the two, same bloke, different cultures, but Romans ripped off everything from the Greeks. It's the, the main god of women and of childbearing. Um, had a temple on the north of Rome. Um, the, the birds, which would often... Uh, come to the shrine of Juno um, when the Gauls were attacking Rome uh, the birds saw them before anyone else did and buggered off early basically and made a bit of a ruckus to the point where uh, everybody in the city wondered what that was all about looked over the walls and then saw the Gaul army sneaking up on them so for, uh, it was seen as a sign at the time um, so everybody uh, so, yeah, Juno was given a lot more uh, respect and power as they thought the goddess had looked over, looked after the city. 
Uh, as a result, they then put the Royal Mint next to... Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, also to our listeners, the Mint is the building where coins are made next to the Temple of Juno. And many Roman coins had uh, Juno Moneta uh, put, on, put on them and a picture of Juno put on the, one of the faces of the coins as a way of just ascribing value to uh yeah to the goddess so that's where the and so juno monita is where the word money comes from i had no idea about that that's incredible i love a good yeah. history lesson well I, I i liked it it's also interesting that the um the the royal mint in rome was constructed in 269 bc the royal mint in england didn't come about until uh, eight, uh, 886 AD, which I thought was really, really bad until I realised one fact. And this one fact kind of made me go, oh, all right, then that's fair enough. Um, England wasn't a country until about that point. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, uh, yeah, didn't, it, it, exactly. Didn't Henry sell the mint as well in 1600s? Henry you know what? That is not something I've. I, that is not something I came across. But I'm definitely going to research into that. Oh, sadly, no, no, I, no, just... I. I also wouldn't put it past him. Like, it, he was. I don't know. All of the all of the stories I read about King Henry uh, the Eighth are that he was a, well, slightly spoilt but incredibly romantic child, who went more from wrong to wronger to massively wronger um wouldn't surprise me if he did that okay um right towards the although the royal mints made coins and the value of those coins for the most part stayed standard um there's a couple of examples throughout history where they weren't standard like at all. Uh, these examples are um, during the 1600s when the Spanish were mining all of the silver uh, out of a single mountain in Mexico, which I can't remember the name of, and that's really going to bother me now because I used to know it. Um, but when, when, the, when those uh, when the Spaniards came back and we also robbed them a fair amount, as is our English way, um, when they got back to Spain, uh, rather than the merchants uh, selling more produce or just being sold out or allowing this influx of, of wealth to create good for the common people, all the merchants and all the guilds put their prices up, which meant only the people returning from Mexico could afford things and all the regular folk were even harder up than before. Which is another case of money not always doing good. Uh, another example. Uh, uh, you know what? There's been loads of examples of times when economies have collapsed. Uh, in a different instance as well. It's it's kind of interesting how much of a powerhouse Spain is throughout history. Like I really need to do a bit more research into this. But um, uh King Philip II of Spain uh, is also what the first and one of the only monarchs in European history to claim man bankruptcy, which he did four times. <laughs> he Quit had a real problem, did he? Yeah, he lived an exorbitant lifestyle and he loved war. He loved uh, declaring money. war. And unfortunately, war costs money. He yeah, and he, I suppose he didn't really do very well in his wars either, given the fact that he had to declare bankruptcy four times. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Like, there are, like, in the last couple of centuries, I, I will admit, I, in my mind, idealism and... Idealism, theology, politics all come, all contribute to war, but there are some wars throughout history where it was solely money. Like, there was the, uh, the mercenary war in Carthage, Mm. Uh, is was solely war, or sorry, was solely money. 
annoyingly, yeah. uh, the Carthaginians uh, didn't have a, much of a standing military. They always hired mercenaries. Um, what they didn't account for is what would happen if they lost, and most of the but most of the mercenaries survived. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened a couple of hundred years BC. Is the Carthaginians lost? Were then ransacked by the Romans. Um, somehow the uh, the mercenaries still felt they were entitled to their pay, as they still had fought to a point. Uh, they yep. show up. They show up to Carthage expecting to be paid, and the Carthaginians had nothing for them, um, which then caused an uproar. And then the mercenary, the mercenary band, then tried to attack Carthage in order to get their money. What then really surprises me is that the local people were able to fight them off, which then makes me wonder why they why needed that... the mercenaries in the first place. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like it just... Ah, but anyway. Um... But it's just, I mean, things like that. It tends to just be exploitation, doesn't it? There's like. I think they, they, I can't remember who quoted it, but there's there's a quote that says, um, "No man is more dangerous than a man protecting his own home." Yeah. You know, no matter, like in that in that respect, um, like the mercenaries just exploited the fact that those people didn't think themselves very strong and kind of tried to make money off them based on that. Whereas, Absolutely. Um, they had no idea that they could actually be as strong as they were well that's it that's it oh uh, okay well um so uh, some other things uh when do you think the first stock exchange was first stock exchange uh i don't know the answer to this question I'm going to go with, um, wasn't it around the spice trade? Wasn't it based you, around you, the spice you are, trade? You are massively thinking along the right lines. I don't know when, though. Okay. So the first stock exchange, as we understand it, uh, was the Dutch East Indian Trading Company. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was held in Amsterdam in 1611 onwards. Um, yeah, which is is interesting that that stock exchange was invented before the Bank of England, uh, which only came into con came into existence in 1694. Yep, uh, which is it was uh... fairly interesting that that's still going. Um, what I I used to like the fact that the bits of paper uh, that you know like banknotes were originally just written bits of paper from the bank and they and even though they were standardized in the 1700s so that there was a template mm. uh, much like checks they still required like signatures and stuff and amounts to be written on them all the way up to um yeah all the way up to the mid eight, uh, the mid 19th century so 1800s um, interestingly, during the Napoleonic eras, the silver standard came first, simply because there wasn't enough gold in the world. So yeah. the, gold, the gold standard only became available as more gold was mined out the ground. Well, yeah. Then... If you if you if you ever played games like um, Terraria, or Terraria. Mm -hmm. So you start off the game, obviously you only get little bits of silver and copper here and there, but obviously the, the, the amount of copper you have eventually leads to you having one silver, and then two silver, and then ten silver, and then twenty silver, and eventually you've got enough to have one gold. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's the same in that respect, I suppose. Like The amount of silver was a lot more abundant, and the likelihood of people having the, the amount of money to add up to one gold um, was going to be less until until money had time to <clears throat> run its rounds and more people ended up accumulating what other people didn't have. Well, absolutely. What what really surprises me is the short-livedness 
of the gold standard. Yeah, it went out now, in the 1930s, didn't it? Absolutely right. Well done. Good background knowledge, mate. Um, the gold standard went out for us in England. The pound was... Yeah, the pound was put to the gold standard in the 1800s. I don't have the exact date here. But it literally was gone by 1931. Mm -hmm. So already by 1931... You um, can no longer take your note and exchange it for gold bullion. Absolutely. But here's another weird thing about the gold standard. So even before we have had the fiat system, which is... I I'm really worried that that's just the way because uh, although I loved this book, the bloke's voice was very American. Like I'm not talking slightly. I'm talking. Ah, uh, you know what? I won't even go into it as I'll come across xenophobe and I love America and like at least the principles on which it was founded. So, um, but yeah, it was just it. It was he. The way he pronounces it is fiat, which sounds like a make a car. Mm -hmm. uh, but like it's where the the money simply worth one of itself it is a entirely free uh formed system of value but even before then um places like america america didn't actually uh get rid of the gold standard until 1971 so 40 years after we had yeah and even during that time um, the National Reserve was only required to have 40% of the money in circulation or of the money in circulation yeah. in gold reserves. Mm -hmm. So they've already increased the amount of value of that gold by 60%. Yep. Yeah. And to, just to be clear, that what what James is trying to get to there is that the Federal Reserve is the main bank of the U.S., OK, it's the main central bank of the US. And if it has, say, a billion dollars in its accounts, then it legally only needed to keep, you say, 40 percent or 60 percent, 40 percent. So it only needed to keep 400 million of that one billion dollars in its accounts to cover any kind of withdrawals. The other 600 million, it could then loan out make up in order yeah. to make more money so absolutely um absolutely. do you know i don't know if you if you're ready to get onto this point but do you know how money how debt is created yes i'm gonna ah uh, well i'm not ready to go on to that just yet but we no 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 we'll, we'll flow it we'll come back to the other stuff yes i know how uh national debt is created although i will admit i didn't know before reading the book but you've clearly well versed in this so let's hear your explanation of it so um if you think about it like every bank is only required to keep a percentage of its accounted money in its like vaults and the other in this in this case 60 percent of it is then loaned back out so but the, the the incredible thing about the monetary system is they don't go okay that person no longer has this amount of money because I've just lent it out to this person what they do is they go okay well I'm just going to create this money out of nothing and put these numbers in their account so if you think about it like if you're thinking about it like digital transactions as things are today it's a lot easier to understand so somebody comes into the bank with ten thousand pounds they go uh, the bank goes, thank you very much, I'm going to keep 40% of that in my vault, so there's £4,000. This other £6,000 I'm going to loan out to this person who wants £6,000. So then they give that £6,000 to this other person, but the person who put in £10,000 into their bank account, their value doesn't change, their bank account doesn't change. They've just created £6,000 out of nothing and given it to somebody else under the proviso that they'll pay it back with interest. They then go to their bank and do exactly the same thing. They put in their £6,000. The bank goes, right, well, I only need to keep 40% of that. And off the top of my head, I don't know what 40% of uh, 6,000 is. But you get the idea. They then lend out that other 60% to the next person. But that original person's bank account doesn't change by six, to, by 6,000 pounds. It doesn't change at all. The, it, it, it's just money created from nothing. And then that goes to the next person. And they go do the same thing. And out of about, I think it's estimated to be offered 10,000 pounds, they can create 100,000 pounds worth of debt. 
This is a any. This is why there is. There is some auditing, but it's the la It's far far less than what I think is acceptable, and what I think most people would find acceptable. What annoys me about the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, I don't know how much. I, I unfortunately this the book I read was written by an American, so it does talk a little bit about the Bank of England, but it talks a lot more about the Federal Reserve. What really weirds me out is that. The Federal Reserve is a government, it's not a pump company, it's not a corporation, it's almost a branch of the government which is not answerable to the government. And that's what I just, I, I don't get. The people the the chair of governors for the federal reserves are are seen as government members but they are not audited by the government and not held to account by yeah by congress at large yeah which makes far less sense than i would like it to it's just incredibly corrupt and if if the very basis, I think it was J.D. Rockefeller who said, um, "Give me control of a country's money supply, and I care not for its law for its laws." Wow, and he literally said that. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Well, you know, money in... money corrupts. Absolutely. Um, it's it's just kind of it's a little bit it's frustrating though because what some people say are oh, well the we should go back to the gold standard when the banks at least used to have some kind of physical backup to the value of money yeah but, but the, the reason they do you know what the reason why they removed the bank the gold standard i do i do that's exactly where i was going yeah okay exactly. so yeah. annoyingly ladies and gentlemen we all Despite the three out of seven, uh, three out of ten children, sorry, going to school and not being able, that not having breakfast, which is still just shockingly bad and a bit depressing, we all have far more than what we should have or what we would have by the gold standard. They're physically isn't enough gold to maintain the lifestyles that we live or the value of money in the world yeah additionally even when spreading out the the uh, reserves so that you've only got like say even if you only had 10 percent if of the actual gold as a gold standard that means you're leaving 90% of your of your population at risk of losing everything if they don't get their wiggle on and get the gold from the bank quick enough but it also puts huge pressure to mine more gold control more gold buy more gold and get and get it it's all of the messed up stuff like uh, the the wars in the Middle East to do with oil or black gold would start happening everywhere that there's known to be gold underground. One of the first rushes, gold rushes, was in England when the Romans invaded us and found out that we had a number of be uh, precious metals under our shores and started mining that. There are a number of locations which are sacred to indigenous people, but we know there's gold underneath them. If we went back to the gold standard, the chances of us protesting in the street that we shouldn't be stealing land and ruining um, places of natural beauty and places of sacred significance to local tribes is going to go out the window if none of us can afford a bowl of porridge in the morning. Like, it's it's unfortunate that the, the thing I hate about what I've learned about quantitative easing, where 
the bank does literally what Nick has just described, where it creates money out of nowhere, or creates stocks out of nowhere, or creates national debt out of nothing and nowhere, is that it at least keeps the wheels turning. And it is at this point where we are living in a society which is just turning wheels supported and run by air that's not great i'd love to go back to the gold standard but chances are if we did that i'd need to buy a flat cap sorry a flat cap and f start digging for gold in my back garden immediately yeah yeah which is why i kind of lean towards a different form of economy moving forwards but mm. Maybe that's a maybe that's a topic for slightly later on in the in the podcast. Well, I think we should definitely go into go into that at some point. Um, right. Although we've we've spent a lot of our time, so we're just going to go with some random. Well, it's not random. All of my, I call it random, but I found all of these uh, things interesting at least. Um. All right. Can you? I tell you what. Can you get? Can you guess a couple of the facts that I'm going to just hit you with a couple of a couple of facts and we're going to see it? What do you think was the last? Um, hmm. What do you think was the last country to abandon the gold standard? Um, I'm going to go with probably somewhere like Syria. Okay. Um, no, it's it's similar sound, but geographically you're kind of off. If I said Second World War, I think that kind of gives some of it away. If I was to give you that clue. So was it Germany? <clears throat> it was... Hmm. Or, or was it one of the countries that they invaded? It was the country they didn't invade. It was Switzerland. Switzerland. Switzerland, of course. Yeah, because they... The, cause lo they... the lords of sitting on the fence. Y yes, I hate to admit it, but yeah, the people who... Um... No, they absolutely I'm not going to... made their survival. <laughs> they absolutely made their survival by by sitting on the fence. Well, they, they, they did, and you can argue a large amount of money rolled in and out of Switzerland during that time, and a large amount of gold went yep. in and out at that time. I mean, because... a lot of a lot of Nazi gold is said to still be in Switzerland. Well, because of that, they were able to keep on the gold standard until the year 2000. Mm. So mm. over 70 years, are, well, sorry, 69 years after we had had to abandon it, they were, yeah, they were able to stay on it until that time. Yep. Um, yep. But they also got... Um... They also got heavily imbursed, shall we say, by the wealthy, by being essentially a tax haven. They were quite happy to be a tax haven for the wealthy, weren't they, in order to maintain that gold standard? Oh, absolutely. It, it, there's a lot of countries which have done incredibly, incredibly well throughout history, and there is... Oh, you know what? I'm not going to touch more upon the Second World War. I've got a lot to a lot to say about that, but all of that, I wasn't alive during that time. I've just got a lot of second-hand and opinions which have been handed to me. Um, okay, but yeah, Switzerland uh, had the gold standard until uh, until the year 2000. Um, out. I, I'll, I guess I'll just ask you this: Where do you think? Out of strongest currencies, where do you think the British pound, the euro, and the US dollar um, are in when it comes to strongest currencies? Okay, so I think because of the abundance of the currency, their value is actually mediocre. Um, I think the pound is currently lowest with the US dollar slightly above that and then the euro slightly above that but i would say it's probably about middle of the park okay so you were right currency value you were right about where the euro is compared to the dollar um we we although all three currencies are still somewhat strong 
uh, surprisingly strong, if I'm honest with you, because I tend to, well, believe the news when it's like telling me how terrible things are. Um, but the British pound is actually the fifth strongest currency in the world. Okay, okay. I know it wasn't. I know it did sink lower than the euro, um, but it must have clawed its way back up because Brexit Ex had a massive hit on our, uh, on the strength of the pound. Absolutely. Uh, well, um, the euro is is above, and the US dollar is number ten. Um, but that's down to the abundance of the dollar. It's like its <laughs> strength is diminished by the fact they've got so much of it. Yeah, that's that's. It's true. almost like if you give me a bucket of diamonds, then I'm going to attach them to everything, and it's going to have no value to me anymore. You know, whereas if you give me one diamond. I will put it in a special case and put it on a shelf so I can admire it and it can sit there and I'd be really happy with it and it's never going to go to anybody else because it's my diamond. You know, abundance creates lack of value. No, that's that's entirely true. Um, I'll tell you what, what do you think is the the currency which is the strongest at, in the world at the moment? Oh, God. Um... I tell you what, I would not have got this, and additionally, I still don't know. I I I had never heard of this currency before. Okay. Is it a rupee? I don't Close. even know that a rupee still exists. Well, there are several forms of rupee. Um, okay. Although, weirdly enough, uh, the Indonesian rupee is in the fifth. Uh, is the fifth lowest um, currency in the world. Okay. Just slightly better that the, than the uh, Sierra Leone uh, Leon. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's the Kitty uh, Kiwati Dinar is the strongest country is the strongest currency in the world, and it's worth uh, about two pounds fifty. Wow, where's that? from yeah exactly uh yeah so the 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 thing is so it's called the dinar and you've also got the Bwani dinar which is the second but i don't even know where that country is um i know a lot of oil countries are have done really well for themselves which is weird because can you guess the the lowest i was really surprised by this can you guess the weakest currency in the world um no i would probably go along the lines of um somewhere african yeah again because because of because the of the perspective yep yep yeah and again it's that stereotype has led, led you led you wrong um it's the iranian right it's the iranian uh rial or rail, rail, it's R I A L. I'm really sorry to anyone from Iran if I'm horribly pronouncing that, but um, like why? I... What? Why is the Iranian um, currency so low? Exactly. Has Consider... it got anything to do with the war? Well, you know what? It wouldn't surprise me. Um, I, t I tell you what, based on. I, some of the other low ones really surprised me as well. Like, um, although, it, again, it shouldn't. Um, okay, so name uh, another country that America's invaded and messed up. Uh, I mean, Vietnam? I, 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 yeah, their currency is the second lowest. The Vietnamese uh, Dong is is literally the second lowest i mean uh, they kept them at war for 20 years long, 20 years and that 20, war costs an extortionate years. amount of money yeah you know we said about this last time like military or the the war can't like people make money off of that and the whole point of the vietnamese war was about making an economy out of war and the americans picked vietnam for some reason they said it was because a passenger U-boat or a passenger boat got um, uh, sunk by the Vietnamese. 
However, there was no evidence of that. The people that they said were victims of that passenger boat being sunk had no family. Nobody even knew who they were. So, a war was started on what they now call a uh, white flag operation. Uh, or oh, a false, okay. flag, false flag operation, which is essentially a lie which led to a 20-year-long war. Mm, much like much like our wars on yeah on Saddam Hussein and his non-existent weapons of mass destruction yeah all right um one one the uh, so I, I tell you what we'll wrap up fairly quickly but um one currency which was in the bottom uh, that was in the bottom 10 that really surprised me was the Ugandan shilling now this really surprised me because do you know what Uganda is also famous for? Uh is it diamonds? Well it's it's part it's partly they've got, you know, they've got a few bits and pieces, but they've also got the highest number of new startup businesses per year. So it's not like they don't have an economy or that they don't have trade. They've got loads of trade and they've got is loads, they, is it all, loads of new ideas. Is it all telemarketing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, no, but like the biggest number of new startup businesses. So like I realize that means you're going to have a lot of people who are just painting signs and painting over signs as like different businesses are set up, fold and then come and go. But like for a country which is producing that many new businesses, I just kind of assumed the economy would be a little bit stronger there. Um, yeah. I mean, it obviously has potential to grow. I mean, you look at, but it's about those those companies, those new startup businesses being successful and drawing in economy, isn't it? So it's not necessarily about the number of businesses; it's quality over quantity. Well, absolutely, that's true. That's true. Okay. Well, there um, is. I've I, I through my note before you round up. What I'm going to mm -hmm. do is I'm going to cut in with the. So it like. So money itself has been around for a long time and a form of currency has been around for a very, very long time. Um, and I'm going back to Jacques Fresco, who, um, as I said in the first podcast, like he's um, one of my favourite human beings to have ever existed. The bloke's a genius. He, um, he was born and was raised around about the same time as the Great American Depression. And the thing that confused him massively was the fact that overnight everything stopped and yet nothing seemed to change. The factories still existed. The materials were still in the factories. And yet there was all of a sudden no money to pay the workers and so the workers stopped. And he, he was massively confused by this the fact that this one thing, which was man-made, could have such a detrimental effect to lifestyle, to um, humanity in general. Like It had a massive impact on um, the American nation. And each depression in their own countries, in their own rights, had the same effect. It was massively detrimental to the economy and to um, its people. And so he set about thinking up um, a means to um, transcend the need for money. And I use the word transcend because I think if you look at the, the path of economy and the path of money um, throughout history, like you said, we started with bartering and then that evolved into a form of um, uh, abundance and then they, they they started using specific tokens um, and then that led to the monetary system and then you had banking start through the Templars I don't know if we covered that but essentially the Templars used to take um, their 
their patrons money, give them a pay off slip, and then at the next city they could that person could go and take that slip to any of the Templars and take their money back out from that person. They didn't need to necessarily get it from the same person. It was one of the perks of being a Templar was that you used to um, securely travel people's wealth around. Um, so that was the first form of essentially banking that existed. Um, however, eventually it evolved into the monetary system that we see today and privatised banks and central banks, etc. etc. Um, but the problem with it is that the debt is now so um, crippling and so out of balance that we're no longer in control of this system um, and it controls us. The need for more money outweighs the need for the produce, the need for the the, um, the the goods that we're providing and that in itself is creating wastage and when you're um, when you're producing exponentially it's truly a unsustainable system so he decided that he would revise the entire thing and he came up with a system which I thought was um, which I thought was really interesting and I think a lot of people should would do better to look into it and it's a resource based economy and essentially it does away with money entirely and bases the economy off of its resources. Um, it would need essentially a um, global um, unity, it would need um, an independent possibly like I spoke to you before about um, uh, AI but almost a govern uh, almost a uh, distribution system that was governed by um, that was governed by a computer that could decide where resources needed to be more um, and how the distribution of those resources would be um, but it would in turn do away with this overbearing need to work every single day to earn money to buy your food. Essentially everybody has a right to um, survival. Everybody has a right to um, food, electricity, um, and if you do away with money, um, technology immediately like leapfrogs. Um, you you take away the restrictions. Your children get get taught by the best that money can, the, the best that they can get, as opposed to the best that money can buy at that time. Um, even if they are learning through um, technology they would still be learning through the best technology because they don't the schools don't have to buy the stuff anymore um, you look at um, technology that goes into cars like every vehicle that exists would be would be built to the highest possible level and because not because that's what's re that cuz that's what's better for resources rather than exactly. what's better for money Exactly, you get phones nowadays that have like an inbuilt expiry date. They're designed to go off at a certain time because the company wants to sell its next model because otherwise the company goes out of business. Why would it sell something that would work for the next 45, 50 years or longer? Because they'd only, they'd only need to supply as many as people exist and then they'd be out of business. They need that continual... Um, resale and the, um, the, same, the same is true of uh, of light bulbs there are patents out there for light bulbs which you know like I, I i don't believe anything lasts forever you know like i don't believe anything is well you know obviously gold lasts for a very long time but i believe all yeah. things downgrade all things break apart and decompose like just the rules of uh oh what's the wrong right way of putting it the law like just the laws of entropy and stuff yeah. but what i will admit is is that you can make stuff last for a very long time like tv yeah. existed for a hundred years why is it that they only seem to last five ten maybe 20 if you if you bought a really really good one i remember you know? my first tv 
when it blew, my granddad replaced the, the, the tube light in the back of it, and all of a sudden it, it was fine. You know? Love it. Um, whereas, if I took apart my TV now, I'm more likely to kill myself because of the, the, the like, the, um, capacitors that are inside the TV are highly dangerous. You wouldn't want mm. to take apart a TV because of how dangerous it is, you know, or a, or a computer screen, or, or these things that you should be able to just fix. Um, but you can't, because they're proprietary. Yeah. They're designed to be fixed by one and only person that is the company that designed them, and therefore you, they still have a service. Like, my screen breaks on my phone, because I've got an, a super fandangled, top-of-the-range phone that needs to be fixed in a, in a vacuum environment, so it's free from dust, etc. I have to give it back to Samsung for them to fix it. And then they can give it back to me. Absolutely. Or like, I've heard there's a light bulb. You know what? I'm, I'm going to need to do my research on that one. But like, and I will unfortunately somehow squeeze this into the next episode. Um, but I know that there, there are light bulbs out there which can last decades, literal decades of yep. daily use. And yet... I went around my mum's house the other day and all of the ones on the landing are broken and I can remember and it's I think it's only maybe a year a year and a half since since we replaced those now yeah the electrics in the house are dodgy I'm not gonna pretend that they're not but at, at this day and age we can make things incredibly fancy what yeah hell can't we make them well yep yep and the, the point is we can but there are there are legal acts there are actual acts that um force companies to create expendable products because of the economy mm. they must in order to keep money coming into the economy they must create products that do not last forever that is part of um, governmental acts on economy. If I can't remember the exact acts, but I will find out. Um, and I know that for a fact um, that, like, they have to be able to put more money in to the economy. It's a lot of the same reason why um, pharmaceuticals don't necessarily ki like um, cure your illness. They sustain your illness because by sustaining your illness, they keep the economy going. They keep money coming in. They don't want to cure you with one tablet when they can sell you 50 tablets and all of a sudden it... their, their, their money is increased exponentially and the economy continues. So I don't... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not this guy's massive fan in the world, um, but Chris Rock's uh, skit on, uh, on this kind of sums it up perfectly. When he start, um, he says that he, he says exactly what you've said, that there isn't any money in a cure, there's money in treatment. So he, uh, you know what he goes, I, I won't repeat the stuff he says because I don't want to us to get banned or for you to get fined or anything. Um, but he names some a number of horrible illnesses and uh, just says, yeah, they're not going to get cured, but they will get. But they will become treatable. Like eventually, you're going to get somebody show up to work and, and just go, "Ah, oh, my insert horrible name of disease here was acting up." Sadly, yeah. it, it, the joke doesn't work unless I actually name the horrible disease. But it's an offensive joke, so I won't go too far into it. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's. It's why you can't. Everything nowadays isn't, you don't buy or own anything, it's always let and subscribe. And the same is true of the housing rental, sorry, you know what, we're going off on one here. Uh, the housing rental market, every single entertainment service, you no longer buy a video cassette, even if it did break after 50 times of watching it. You don't buy DVDs anymore, you don't buy games, you buy streaming services you buy certain platforms which give you access services. to games yeah 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 it's 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 yeah, all exactly. like it if it wasn't for the fact that 
food doesn't work like that. You need the physical object and you use the physical object. I'm sure, you know, there might become a time when you start getting subscription services to, to Tesco's. And you can no, but there is. There's um, oh, one off the top of my head is... Um... Are you thinking about the protein shakes and stuff like Huel? Not the protein... No, because there's a meat subscription service. I was looking at it the other day, actually, kind of going like... I was actually looking at their hamper because um, essentially my idea for, for shopping is I'm very ritualistic. I tend to eat the, the same meals, um, but on a rotation. Like there's, there's variation there, but I know what I like to eat, and therefore I tend to eat a week's worth of ritualistic meals. No, that's fine. What's your favourite day of the week? Uh, to be fair, my lunch every day is macaroni cheese because I am a monster for macaroni cheese. Oh, keep <laughs> going. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, so this subscription service, well, what the main point, as I said, was like a hamper, so a meat hamper, where there was like chicken breasts and steaks and mints and everything else, and you pay like £30 for a box of a variety of different variations of these meats because um, I can't eat pork so I, I was looking specifically for something that I could cater myself um, and then when I went to the checkout they went okay fine do you want to buy this once or would you like to subscribe to this every week or every month or every year um, you know like what what's your what's your like every month we will send you this and you will give us 30 pounds like hold on I, when I go shopping, I go, oh, I don't need that this month. I don't need that this month. I don't need that this month. Um, I'll go shopping for this, you know? Um, surely buying food on a subscription ends up with you having more than you can possibly use. But that's that's the point. This is the point that I was making with this resource-based economy. Like, it never, it doesn't come down to you having more than you actually need. You have exactly what you need. And yes, like there are still jobs for you to do. But if you know that you're only required to uh, like put your physical into the economy, for lack of a better term, um, for three months of a year in order to keep humanity's um, wheel turning, there's your incentive. You don't need money as an incentive to work. You need freedom as an incentive to work. You want to be free for nine months of the year then apply yourself for three months. Yeah? Yeah. Like, money is... It, it's... Like, I hate to say, but it's kind of reaching its end of um, relevance. Especially with the the way that um, human beings are uh, developing. I can't help but think that the monetary system and the economy that we have as we know it is going to change drastically because mm. of... Um, the way that debt is at the moment, the the state that debt is in, it 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 limits the ability of so many, um, while empowering so few. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll we'll call it a day there. Um, listeners, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Nick, thank you very much for producing. Hope. Uh, yeah. Hope uh, everybody's learnt something i know through the research for this i definitely have um have a good night everybody and we'll uh we'll see you again in another couple of weeks cheers take care guys bye bye